Now, um, so I'm talking to Michael Falcone, he's the filmmaker behind the Hall of Giants documentary which is been nominated at our festival release. Congratulations, well done. Thank you. Thanks for the, your, your time. Oh, thanks for your time, Steve. Um, so yeah, if you could just give us a brief synopsis of what this documentary is about and then we can just sort of go from there. Sure, sure. Uh, it's a documentary. Um, it's basically about a very popular public art piece yeah. in Seattle. Um, it was made in 1990 for very little money and it became a huge success and it's second only to the Space Needle in terms of popularity. It's yeah, like how many people visit it. Yeah. So the documentary is ostensibly about it being an underground success story but it's also about the endurance of public art and what public art can do for a neighborhood because that piece actually really did help define uh, a neighborhood in Seattle called Fremont. It really helped define that as an artist's neighborhood. Um, but unfortunately, it was kind of a victim of its own success. Um, that's a region that a lot of the artists can't afford to live in anymore. It's a very really? old, it's an old story. So th that's very much what's happening all over the place. The UK is a prime example, like Brixton in London. Yeah. And now, forget it, you won't have a better bar, it's just horrifically expensive. Yep. Now, what, I mean, there's any number of projects you can choose to film about. I mean, it's endless. I right. imagine you're looking at projects all the time, but what in particular made you, drove you to actually make a documentary about this piece of art in particular? Well, it was circumstance. Um, just a bit of background. I'm originally from Chicago. Yeah. And uh, my sister-in-law at the time, previous marriage, lived in Seattle. I came out to visit a few times. Mm -hmm. And uh, we visited uh, the neighborhood of Fremont uh, because they do a, a parade every year, the Fremont Solstice Parade. It's yeah. on Solstice. And it's a, it's a very popular parade. It brings out as many as 100,000 people. Um, but it's done on a wing and a prayer and, again, very little money. And it's put on by an outfit called the Fremont Arts Council, which Thank you, Fremont Arts Council. That's why I'm here. Um, so I went out to see a parade. I thought the parade was neat. And when I came back out to live here, to live in Seattle, I came across the volunteer coordinator, and she said it was the, the 20th annual parade this year. And I said, well, I'd like to actually see if I can film some of that and some of the story behind it. So I did that. And then I became on the Fremont Arts Council board. Right. And once I was a board member, um, it became the 20th anniversary of the Fremont Trolls being created. So I said, has anybody ever done a documentary on that? And they said, no. Because you could have, I assume, did you think about actually doing one about the, the actual... Well... Because I guess that crossed <laughs> your mind. I set out to, and I have tons of footage, I set out to cover not just the parade, but the people behind the parade yeah. and all the organization that goes into it. Um, I was not quite experienced enough to pull it off. Um, I was pretty new to doing independent filmmaking on my own and not being part of somebody else's production. So I shot a bunch of things and I didn't have enough background and basically it didn't go anywhere. I made a nice trailer, but it didn't, didn't ever go anywhere. So I said, well, maybe someday I can make it right. But then the, the Fremont Trolls birthday came up and I'm like, okay, this is, this is the film I can do. It's a contained subject. And it's a static piece. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The parade was nuts. I was running all over town to different places that, you know, marching bands were practicing and dancers and stuff. It was chaotic. Uh, the troll was confined. Yeah. And um, plus I knew the Arts Council pretty well at that point. And so um, Barbara Lukey, who is um, one of the people that brought that parade up uh, from Santa Barbara, California to Seattle, she was the volunteer coordinator um, with the Fremont Troll. And so I got to know Barb. and. Barb basically doled out a bunch of leads, like here's who you talk to, and here's, you know, here's their contact, here's the background, here's the story on the troll. And she basically laid out a bunch of information and it was just up to me to connect the dots and craft the story from there. Because so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm assuming that even before you shoot a frame of film, you, you have to do a, a shed load of research. Oh yeah. And how, I mean, how long did the actual research take and then how long did the film take to put together? I think I spent six months researching wow. and basically trying to get names of, there were a lot of people that were involved in the building of the troll. Yeah. So it was trying to find out who the original artists were behind the troll and then who helped them, yeah. what their connections were, what their background was. It was quite a bit of research. And then I did a ton of photographic research, uh, archival research, etc. So I would say six months spent 
gathering information before I even got an interview on tape. And I did pre-interviews too. Oh, you done pre-interviews? I did, and you know, it seemed duplicitous to do it, but it actually really helped me and it helped the subjects that I was interviewing because yeah. they had somewhere to go. And one thing I learned in a class I audited on filmmaking is part of the pre-interview is you ask them, do you have some materials? that oh, yeah. I could possibly Some pictures or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus they get to know you and it's not like they're starting cold. Yeah, you know, what a great idea, yeah. Yeah. So And of course you can cut you can separate the wheat from the chaff because some of them I guess. Oh yeah. You might be looking thinking this isn't really what I want. Right. And that's there's not nothing negative about that, it's just a fact of life, isn't it? And then, right. And so you've kind of stopped yourself wasting even more time by Yeah, I get that. Yep. So okay, six months of research and then how long to, to put the whole thing well, that was a long process. Um, you know, I started this film in 2010, and the current and final cut uh, didn't come out until 2015. Right. Um, so, the actual editing of it, um, I got a grant from the city of Seattle. It was a Seattle City Artist Grant, and I basically had roughly a year to put out a cut right. that would satisfy the grant. So, mm -hmm. it was a good year's time of heavy editing and interviewing. Um, and then... Because a, a year sounds a long time, but I know it's not, because it'll it's go not. like that, <laughs> won't it? Yeah, it was intense. Um, yeah, I'm in a band, too. Yeah. Uh, it's called Sea Star. Plug. Um, hello, Sea <laughs> Star. We, I miss Hopefully you. Hopefully they're watching. They might be. Um, I don't know. It's about, I don't know. What's the happens? about eight hours behind, is it? Nine hours. Nine, oh, unlikely. There's an early riser in the, in the band, but... Um, so yeah, short story is I was in the band and um, I, I was editing this film on a 2008 MacBook, not a Pro, a MacBook. So, um, so how was that up to the task? Because I mean, it's not. Part, it's not, is it really? <laughs> no, <clears throat> no, it was in no way up to the task. And I knew I, I had somebody in line to do the finishing editing, but I really wanted to build as much of the story on my own as I could. Yeah. I wanted to get at least a good story rough together before I handed it off. Yeah. So um, I spent a lot of time, um, I, was rented a, I was renting a house, bottom half of a house, and I was at a porch. And um, I spent a lot of time chain smoking and editing on my porch because I was getting cabin fever. Yeah, yeah and stressing out. And stressing out. And I remember during the winter t taking like these $2 gloves I got from a, a store and like cutting the fingertips off so I could edit. Oh, no. in the, because I, I couldn't stay Seriously? indoors anymore, you know, and I had to take a two-month hiatus from the band. And we gig fairly regularly. We're, well, to finish it, to actually put... Uh, yeah, right. yeah, to get it in the can, at least that cut. Yeah, how many versions? Because oh, I know documentaries often have yeah. like three or four different versions. Let me think. So, the original cut was an hour and 41 minutes. Right. Um, then I made a cut that was about an hour and a half. Yeah. And then I made a cut that was about an hour and 10. Then I made a cut that was 50 minutes because uh, our PBS affiliate in yeah, Seattle. Yeah. So it's broadcast length, I guess. Yeah, 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 the public broadcasting. They, um, they were interested in the movie. Um, they didn't take it in the long run, but they, they needed a 50 minute cut. So I had to pare it down considerably, which was quite a lesson because I, you know, the problem I had with the film originally is that there were too many storylines, <coughs> too much going on. So I cut it down to 50, but I felt like there were some pretty key things missing. Right. Then I added back in roughly 10, 11 minutes to its present cut today. So what are we talking, like half a dozen? And there was actually a short version too, which didn't really, hasn't really done very well. But, well, because um, there's just not enough in there, I guess. Or you need to have enough. the more, yeah, need to, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And was it pretty much, I know the story you wanted to tell hmm. about the, do I refer to it as a sculpture? How do, what's the best way to refer it to? It's... It's a, technically it's a statue. Right. Um, it's a ferro cement. Ferro cement is used in ship making. Um, it's cement and sand roughly. And you can do some pretty neat stuff with it. You can do some sculpting. And the statue um, is it's framed with rebar. Right. So you start basically with a rebar frame. You get your footings in. You dig your footings in like a building. Yeah. Um, and uh, the troll is actually hollow, which oh, I didn't know. Yeah. No. I, I, see. Now you've said it, it makes sense, because why would you have solid? It would be a nightmare, wouldn't it? Well, you know, most statues are solid. Right. As far as I know. But um, this is not. <laughs> they did it basically, it's essentially a, a, a shell. 
So the rebar is formed to, to do the basic outline, and this is in the movie too. And then there's basically... We call that a facade. I don't know if you call that a facade. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And then it's basically hung in between with hardware cloth, which is basically like deluxe chicken wire. You know, so you've got yeah. your ways to kind of do your general shaping. And then you apply the ferro cement with like a hose. It was, I think it was a stucco equipment that they right. used yeah. to lay it in. <clears throat> and then you have trowels on the other side to kind of capture um, so it doesn't go all the way through. So you have basically the outside shell being formed and then the insides being pressed in. And it's all the rebar is sealed because that helps it to prevent it from deteriorating. And so you basically you're, wind, you're winding up with the shell. And there's definitely some sculpting and some like trowling that happens on the outside because the troll has hair. It's yeah, a troll. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you go and you do that kind of fine detail work on the outside when it's still drying. And are, was everyone that you approached happy to contribute or did anyone say, yeah, I don't well, really, you know, it's not for me? There was one of the original artists that um, did not want to be interviewed on camera. He said he'd be okay with doing voiceover, but I thought it would be a little awkward to, I wasn't sure how to yeah. work with that. Yeah, I can see how that would be, because someone would be thinking why aren't you on script because I would be thinking why isn't that going yeah you know and it doesn't it seems a bit odd if there isn't that visual reference then yeah. it, it is kind of unusual so and he's, he's a great guy I mean he gave me some really excellent slides of uh, the, the troll being built and he just said yeah I, I didn't want to be on camera so I said okay so he's referred to in the film mm. but he isn't featured in the film but everybody uh, everybody else was game uh, one of the artists doesn't live in Seattle she lives in Missouri uh, Donna Walter. And so that's a bit of a mission, isn't it? To yeah, and I had some ideas on how to do it. We had a plan where I was going to go at the University of Missouri, like go with a film film student and like have him do a remote shoot. It just, I, because of the grant, I, you know, I just was running out of time. So yeah, yeah. Um, ostensibly I got the lead artist, Steve Bedanes, who was very, very cooperative and good about giving me anything I needed. Um, and then his assistant um, at the time, Ross Whitehead, who was, uh, Steve was an uh, architectural uh, visiting professor at University of Washington. And then he had his protege that was also working on the troll. Um, so they were, they were totally game with it. And do you think you've told the vision of the story you had to begin with, because you must have saying in your mind's eye, is the end result, does the end, not does the end justify the means, that's not what I'm asking, but is the end result what you wanted it to be? Yes, and it's more. Right. Um, what is your, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I didn't think I'd have a feature. But when I started interviewing these people, a lot of them were talking about the times that bore the troll. Why, why was the troll made to begin with? Mm. Why in Seattle? Why then? And you what know? is that reason? What, what, why why well, did they build it? It is the troll... You, you can't tell by looking at it, but it's basically a, a monument that is anti-gentrification. Right. So when, when the troll was built, um, real estate values doubled in Seattle in 1990, like, like from the years 1988 to 1990, they doubled. In two years? Yeah, two or three years. They just skyrocketed, and it's happening again right And it's now. gone up even, even oh, more so, of course. It's, oh, no, it's obscene, it's, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. So the troll was, it, trolls by myth, by legend, um, they're, they just don't like to be bothered. They're generally peaceable unless they're aroused and they're bothered. So the troll sits under a, a very, um, very popular, busy highway in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. And so the troll is under the bridge and he has um, a Volkswagen, which is an actual Volkswagen in his hand. Right. Well, an actual what, Beetle? Is it a Beetle? It's a Beetle. It's a Beetle, it's a beetle yeah. Volkswagen in his hand. And the, the sim symbolism is he reached up on the bridge and grabbed one of the cars down. Right. and was keeping it for his own, maybe to eat it, as one kid thought when he looked at the statue. And it's interesting because that gives a really idea, because we're talking about a huge scale here, and even oh, yeah. if you haven't seen the film, just saying, oh, I know, because I've seen it, but just grabbing the car yeah. should give you an idea in your mind of the scale of that the project. A Volkswagen Beetle fits in the hand of the troll. That gives you some perspective. It's 16 feet tall. Right. Um, it's a big structure, and it's not... It's not a whole troll, it's basically, and that was one of the things that made it easier to build. It's basically the bust of the troll. It's, it looks like it's coming out of the ground. Mm. So it's the bust of the troll, the shoulders, the hands, and the head. Um, so if the whole troll was visible, it would probably be on the order of 25 feet tall. Right, okay. Yeah. But it's not. And 
I know you're, this is all about the promotion of this film, but I'm guessing you're doing a new piece now. You were, if, if you can't talk about it, I'll totally understand. Sure. But no. Are you working on another one, another documentary? Um, yeah, um, I just finished a short called Kids Toys, um, which is based on a, a rare toy museum in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Um, it's a 13 minute short. A documentary or? or it's a documentary. Or, right, okay. Yeah. I've only really, I, my interests and my pension are in historical documentaries. That's that's what I find interesting. I, I've, I have an English background and I, I do, I've done a lot of research papers. My wife, who is one of the reasons I'm here today and was able to complete this film, because I was going nuts. Um, we met each other in grad school. We have a long history, and right now she's working on school stuff. But yeah, yeah. I have a background in crafting research papers. So I, I kind of approach documentaries as a research paper. And what I did... Yeah, because I can see the correlation there, because really what you're doing is talking about something that's real, Yeah, frankly, aren't you? It, it's a text. Yeah. Film is a text. I'm not, you know, I'm certainly not the first person to think of that. But um, I treat it as a research paper in that it's the same thing. You're gathering sources and materials. Mm. You're making connections to form an idea that is supported through your sources. And your push is basically your own thesis. You know, it's it's research basically. It's a research paper that is a visual text. So what I did with the troll movie, and which I've done since, which is laborious but it works, is I've done a written transcript of every interview. Oh no! Nice. Every so, interview. How long does that take? How would you Forever. have the patience to do that? I had a little help, but mostly it was me typing up. And I'm not a transcriptionist. I know people in my work do that, but um, it but takes a long time. But if you've recorded, which I assume you have, mm -hmm. why? I suppose the question is, why would you do? Why would the, you do that? Yeah. Because shifting through film and finding different parts of the film takes a while. If you have, um, for me, because again, I'm word-based, if you have a script that you can work from, and I actually, took, I actually took the transcript and I broke it down into an Excel sheet mm. where I had <clears throat> the, the first cell was the basic, of, the basic logistics of who was talking, what they were talking about. Yeah. And so with that Excel sheet, I was able to shift around yeah. the different yeah. pieces and the different storylines so I could kind of build my story. Right. It was very laborious to get to that point, but once I got to that point, I was able to craft a narrative that was more malleable. You have to understand my, my tech also is really antiquated. But before I handed it off to my finishing editor, it was a 2008 MacBook. So uh, the wheel of the beach ball, the wheel was going round and round a lot. Spinning so, all the time. Yeah, it was one of the. Re I felt like I was getting hypnotized. Um, so having that to begin with, and starting from that script, was, I think the reason why I'm another reason why I'm here and fortunate to be here is because I could make a narrative. Because it was, I had a lot of different storylines to work with. But so have I'll you it together. have you never thought about um, making a fictional piece? Yeah, I've, I've written. It's going to cost your mind, isn't it? It's, you know, I'm, I'm a creative writing major, so it's sort of odd that I'm into documentaries. I have a couple scripts that are narrative scripts. I, I think narrative film, I, my hat's off. I've, you know, talked to a few of the filmmakers here. My hat's really off to people that can pu pull off narrative filmmaking. I think it's really tough. Documentaries, you can pull a lot out of them. And the kernel of your story can remain. You can do a lot of recrafting. I think narratives are much harder to do. And you're also working with actors and different takes. And it's tough. It's tough to do a narrative. I wor I've worked on narrative features. And I want to do it someday. But I kind of feel like I'm not ready. Mm. I'm not quite ready. I feel like I'm much more prepared since I've done these things. But. Um, yeah, sure, I've thought about narratives. And, and how do you make sure that when you're, when, I suppose it's, the question is really post-production, but how do you make sure when you finish the film you haven't missed something that's really important to the story? I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, well, you screen it for people. Um, I did a lot of pre-screening. You know, the reason why this film has been cut down and down is because, um, you know, it started out as a one, one hour and 40 minute cut. Now it's... 61 minutes you get feedback um, you see people that are shifting around too much you see people that get up 
you, you talk to people. I did pre-screenings where I was completely out in the open. I'm like, do your worst. Tell me what you think. And I got, was fortunate in that I had honest criticism, and supportive, but honest criticism about it. It was more to me about knowing what too much was. Yeah. It was scaling it back. Yeah. And once I got to the point where I felt like the essence of the story remained, but it wasn't too expletive, you know, it was, then I felt like this, this current cut, I think, does its job. It was about pulling things out rather than what did I miss. Yeah. yeah. I started large so that I didn't miss anything, and then I realized what I could miss. And I shouldn't really ask this question, we're going to anyway, because it's, it. it's always difficult to answer this, but I'm particularly intrigued with documentary makers. Do you look at other films, is it a documentary that you can put, you look at and say, I really wish I'd have made that, well that's such a great story, or really, so I guess I'm kind of asking you if you have a favourite, without asking you if it's a favourite, because I think it's always a hard one to answer. Do I have a favourite documentary? Um, It's hard to say. I mean, Touch the Sound was a pretty amazing film. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of what it's about, but it's ostensibly it's the first documentary I saw so much crafting, because documentaries have changed so much. They used to be more like educational films. Yeah. They were about in, get, get, gathering information. Uh, Touch the Sound was like the, f the first one I saw that it was more about how it makes you feel. Um, the impression that you get from uh, the subject matter, um, the feel of it, and it wasn't about gathering information. It was it was like a narrative in that it was an experiential experience. That was pretty neat to see. Um, I don't watch as many documentaries as I should. Um, who can? There are so many. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, I don't really have a true favorite. Um, I like different styles. Um, I don't like documentaries that are too flashy. There's a lot of flash animation going on in the editing world. Yeah, we see quite a bit of that, actually. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, that's crept in. It, it's great in that it illustrates things. I just think in the internet age, it's getting very flash and dash. A lot of style, no substance. Um, I don't like seeing that so much. Mm. Um, I haven't seen Montage of Heck, which is the documentary about Kurt Cobain. But it's very stylized. You have, or ha you have. I seen have not. No. But I, I, I've seen trailers. <coughs> I've talked to people. It's very stylized. Um, I'm, I'm more after the story. I don't like things that, the artifice that gets the scrim that gets in the way of the story. I, I want to see the story more than I want to see the flash. Um, so I, it could be that documentaries are going in, in a direction that I think people will learn from their mistakes and they'll pull it back. Yeah. Yeah. Or not. It just may be the future. Michael, that's it. Thank All you right. very much. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Brilliant. It's almost like a member of the family in a way. But I was always actually quite surprised when the guys on the panel said, we've got to do the troll. And I was kind of shocked that I had to gulp and do it. I think we probably thought we'd be visiting more than the Space Needle. It's, it, it maybe is. I say that eventually it'll overtake the needle. I told Steve Bedanis that when we were building it. The needle's there, so what? You take a picture of it. But the troll, you take a picture of while you're standing on its shoulder. So Trolloween, somewhere early on, we publicized it. And about 3,000 people showed up, and they trashed the neighborhood. The uh, Fremont Arts Council, which was sponsoring the competition, contacted us and said, eh, we don't believe you can actually build that. And so a, a lot of artists showed up, including myself, that said, hey, let's get a project together. So there was a public vote and there was a design build team that put in a proposal and it was for the troll. <laughs>